Under the Speaker's announced policy of January 9, 2023, the Chair recognizes a gentleman from Texas, Mr. Cloud, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's uh, great to be here with you this evening. You know, what every American wants, what every Republican wants, is a strong military. We realize that is our number one constitutional obligation. We want a, the most capable, the most lethal military in the world. We need them to maintain peace and security. When we do have to send them into harm's way, we want them to go with a clear mission, with every tool they need for victory. And then when they come home, we want to take care of the veterans. Make sure they're welcome, make sure they're cared for, make sure they have everything they need to succeed following their service to our country in uniform. Unfortunately, what we've seen lately is our military has, in many ways, gone off its primary mission of protecting and securing and preparing to continue to secure our nation. And they've gotten into social engineering, indeed, teaching CRT and DEI and advancing things like gender ideology. We've heard about drag shows at uh, military bases, taxpayer-funded abortion travel, taxpayer-funded transgender surgeries. And it's certainly affected our recruiting. It's affected our capabilities. It's affected our readiness and our ability to project power around the world. I was happy to support the NDAA as it left this Congress because it was focused as it left the House and went to the Senate because it was focused on getting our military back to its focus, its purpose of protecting and securing our country, of being that strong, lethal fighting force and getting out of what we've known to become this woke move toward the military that has affected our capability. Also, a part of that, let's talk about the process it was supposed to go to. We understand that we send forth a good bill from the House and then it goes to the Senate and there's supposed to be a conference on that. As a matter of fact, many members worked to get on that conference committee. Many other members worked to support people who would get on that conference committee in order to work and support different objectives that were in there. And one of the couple things we were working on in our office was a bill that would let rank and file military be able to go into work in, in military contracting right after service. Now there's been a law that was meant to keep, for example, generals who are making you know, big time decisions about government, for example, going to Raytheon and serving on a board and, and because it wanted to make sure that their, their military decisions were not affected by future board positions. But the rank and file of our military kind of fell under that. And for example, we have an army depot in our district where the rank and file cannot be employed after their retirement from military service there for six months until after they're retired. And by then, they've often had to move on and find other careers. Uh, we also had another provision that we were working on to make sure that the depots throughout our country who are tasked with the important duty of restoring and re re refurbishing our military hardware, supporting the warfighter and doing it in a, an efficient manner, that they continue to be able to thrive and survive and those things fell off in what was our alleged conference. Now this conference was actually instead of the members that we elected to send there and to go to represent this body that we, we elected and voted on in this conference or in this Congress to send to conference. Instead, four people got together, the staffs probably of those four people made the decisions and those two provisions were taken out of this bill as well. Let's talk about the House rules all year we talked about rewriting the muscle memory of Congress. We worked hard. We, I cannot tell you how many times we've heard the importance of single subject bills and that we as Republicans were going to advocate for that. We weren't going to marry things that were extraneous to each other. We were going to have uh, bills that had to deal with germaneness. We, we, we added a germaneness rule in January that had never existed where we're going to say any any Amendments to bills have to be germane. Anything we're going to add on to a bill has to be germane. Well, uh, come to find out that now we have the NDA, which has come back from the Senate with a number of woke provisions added into it, and added to that now is a FISA extension. Now, in the Senate, the parliamentarian says that that is not germane to the NDAA. Now, in the House, we actually have a tougher NDAA, or a tougher germaneness rule. 
But how are we getting around that? Well, we're just going to put it on the suspension calendar. We're just going to suspend the rules and say the rules that we said we were going to operate by, we're not going to operate when it comes to this bill. This is a tragedy. And then finally, when it comes to the Constitution. Now, the Constitution is clear that Americans should not be un unwarrantly surveilled. Yet we know we have a DOJ that has been doing that. They've well extended their authorities. We had so much FISA abuse, literally hundreds of thousands of instances of FISA abuse, and yet we're asking for a clean extension of these provisions. Now, the Constitution was not, be, was not written to be shredded in times of crisis or urgency. As a matter of fact, the Constitution was written specifically to place limits on our government in times of crisis and urgency. So it's not a time for us to look away and say, well, but if we'll shred the Constitution a little bit here. The very purpose the Constitution exists is to protect us in times like this and to make sure that we continue to protect the rights of the American people. And so it's extremely, extremely important that we do everything we can to make sure that we do not pass a FISA out of this House that does not protect the American people. We cannot continue to allow them to spy on the American people, to surveil them without a warrant. And so let's get back to what we're here for. The NDA, we want an NDA that's going to focus our military. We, we, are, we realize the importance of the first constitutional uh, responsibility of this House to fund a military that will defend our Constitution, that will protect this land. We are willing to do le that. Let's revisit this NDA. A. Let's send this back to conference. Let's get us focused on what needs to be done. And for goodness sakes, let's not put a FISA extension that does not protect the rights of the American people. With that, I'm happy to be joined by my good friend from the great state of Texas. Another second. <laughs> Gentleman from Texas. Well, I appreciate my friend. Much time is required. I appreciate my friend from Texas yielding, and I appreciate his remarks because we share a um, committed interest in defending the United States and defending our military and ensuring that our military is able to do its job. Uh, just in the last, I think, 24 hours, I saw that one of our generals uh, put forward a uh, report basically detailing the extent to which our recruiting levels and morale levels are low. That it's at a uh, particular time of difficulty for them in terms of recruiting. And I think that for my colleagues, particularly on this side of the aisle, who I've been engaging with about the National Defense Authorization Act, which is, I believe, going to be on the floor tomorrow under a suspension of the rules, which means uh, we're not going to go through regular order. We're not going to be able to amend it. We're not going to be able to have any real significant debate on it. We're suspending the rules of the House, and we're going to try to jam this bill through uh, with basically trying to get two-thirds of the chamber to just say, let's get this done, let's get out of town, let's go home for Christmas and send it to the Senate. Well, that's wrong, because the problem is, our, to my colleagues who think we need to do this for our men and women in uniform, the truth is, this is undermining our men and women in uniform. We're destroying the soul, we're destroying the culture, we're destroying the morale of those men and women who sign up to serve and who are frustrated. They're frustrated by, putting in, by being put in indoctrination classes on diversity, equity, inclusion. They're frustrated by critical race theory being pushed. They're frustrated by abortion tourism funding with taxpayer dollars and transgender surgeries. They're frustrated by being fired from their job because they dare to say no to getting a COVID vaccine. They're frustrated about the state of affairs when our military is being turned into a social engineering experiment instead of being committed to its core function, which is to defend this country when called upon to do so. That's the truth. And our men and women in uniform want change. They want us to stand up and change it. So what did Republicans do? In one of the great demonstrations of what a body can do with a bare thin, you know, razor thin majority, we passed a National Defense Authorization Act in July that was a responsible bill that would fundamentally 
uh, fundamentally make sure our military is focused on its core responsibilities and would ensure that our military is able to do its job without being focused on engineering. And with that, I'm going to The gentleman yield will to the suspend. Chair. Yeah. The chair will receive a message. Madam Speaker, a message from the Senate. Madam Speaker. Madam Secretary. I have been directed by the Senate to inform the House that the Senate has agreed to the report a committee of the conference to H.R. 2670, an act authorized appropriations for fiscal year 2024 for military activities of the Department of Defense and for military construction and for defense activities of the Department of Energy to prescribe military personnel strengths for such fiscal year and for other purposes. Gentleman from Texas is recognized. Well, I thank the uh, chair, um, and I appreciate getting the message from those who delivered it. Um, and, you know, to say, we had more people than just two of us on the floor. I'm pretty excited. It was, it was a great night in the uh, House chamber. Uh, this is fantastic. We had a great audience. It's not just speaking to, to the uh, echo chamber as, as, it, as it will. We had a couple up in the, up in the uh, bleachers up there. But, um, look, here's the thing. Republicans passed a responsible National Defense Authorization Act that will make sure our military is focused on its mission. You can see here House GOP's bill, right? All of the green check marks, what we're talking about here, we ended President Biden's taxpayer-funded abortion travel fund, which enables abortion tourism with taxpayer-funded dollars. We ended taxpayer-funded gender transition surgeries. We ended Biden's radical climate agenda and the uh, carrying out of his executive order, which will promote and push his radical agenda into our military so that we'll have a forced migration to electric vehicles and all of the uh, uh, mandates of the Biden uh, executive orders in the Pentagon. It would protect service members who were discharged for refusing the COVID-19 vaccine. It would ban the drag shows and drag queen story hour on DOD installations, prohibit critical race theory. It would create an inspector general for the Ukraine aid. It would prohibit race-based admissions at our military academies. And it would eliminate the chief diversity officers and all of these positions that are divvying us up by race. But here's the thing. Senator Schumer and the Democrats created a bill that did none of those things because they want our military to be a social engineering experiment. Now to my colleagues on this side of the aisle that said, Chip, you're just focusing on the social issues. That's not true. That's not true. COVID vaccines that force some of our men and women in uniform off of their duty, that's not a social issue. That's their job. It is also not true if you go look through all of the things, for example, the Inspector General with respect to Ukraine, other issues. None of the changes that we embrace to try to get our military focused where it needs to be were embraced by Democrats. So then what happens? At the end of the year, when everybody's panicked and they go around this town and all of the defense lobbyists and all of the people that go around saying, oh my God, you got to pass the National Defense Authorization Act or the entire world's going to end and we're not going to be able to defend the country. Well, that's not true. Okay, it's not true. We believe we should pass such a bill, but that's not true. That's legislating by fear. But what you see here is this NDAA compromise, okay? National Defense Authorization Act compromise. Now, you think that went through some regular process we've been fighting for this year. Go to, quote, conference committee between the Senate and the House. Eh, wrong. That didn't happen. There was a conference set up, but what happened is the leaders all got together, decided what they wanted to jam through before Christmas. They went to the conference and they said, take it or leave it. Basically, they said, take it. And then the conferees sent it back to us. Five of them didn't sign it. That's the truth. So what did we get? Well, you see the red X's? You see the one green check bans critical race theory, which, by the way, hard to enforce, but okay, we got that. You got some weak reforms here with respect to the vaccine issue with COVID-19, and you got weak reforms with respect to the Inspector General of Ukraine. In other words, we got one piece of it. We didn't get everything we had put in there, and that's it. We didn't get the other stuff. But that's not what they're telling you. They'll go around and telling you and they say, oh yeah, we ended the drag you know, queen story hour. That's not true. What they did is they're accepting the Defense Department's characterization of the rules they're going to follow. They didn't actually include the language that restricts it. 
So here's the way this town works. And then I'm going to yield to my friend from Georgia because I just want everybody to understand. This is the way this town works. You govern by fear. You go up to a deadline and you say, you must do this. Because I haven't got to the whipped cream with the cherry on top, which is this defense bill, watered down, that not one Republican should support. Let me be clear. There is no justification for supporting a bill that does not materially change the direction of our military away from being social engineering back toward its mission. But what did they do? They added the extension of surveillance, what we call FISA, okay? What does that mean? You've read about all of the surveillance that has been carried out on American citizens. You know about it all through Carter Page. You know about the extent to which there's been rampant abuses by the FBI targeting American citizens, backdooring the ability to go gather information on non-Americans and use that to target Americans. It happened. They took January 6th names and they stuck them into the database, the query, the database that was collected on these non-American targets. They put the names of January 6th people into the database. Oh, the FBI says, don't worry, we've fixed it. But man, can we really see what it was that they fixed? Can we really look under the hood? We're trying to pass reforms to what we call FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. We should pass reforms right now, before we leave, time, leave town. If we don't, we should all be eating our Christmas dinner on the floor of this house. But no, what are we going to do tomorrow? We're going to take the National Defense Authorization Act with all of these red X's, Yes, it's true, all of you leadership hack staffers that are running around saying it's not true, come down and debate me on it, because it's true. And they're gonna add a FISA extension that will take it to April of this next year, and worse yet, the procedures under that will extend all the way until April of 2025. Then my colleagues get frustrated and they say, well, Chip, why do you say things like, name one thing we've done? Because of this. Because we extend the same stuff and kick the can down the road. We do a National Defense Authorization Act which changes precious little. We jam it through, violating our own rules with respect to germaneness and single subject bills. We pile on FISA, we extend it to April of 25, and then we go to the American people and we lie to them and we say we did something great. We should reject this. My colleagues should reject it tomorrow. We should stand up for the American people. Do what we said we would do. I'm gonna yield back to my friend from Texas. May I ask how much time remains? We now have five minutes remaining. I yield five minutes to the gentleman from Georgia. Thank you to my friend from Texas. Actually, both of my friends from Texas. What an incredible job they've done so far. In communicating that the swamp's compromise NDAA is indeed woke, weaponized, and wrong for America. Why? You may ask. Well, during backroom negotiations, virtually all of the conservative wins that the House Republicans fought for were removed. This is a disaster for both our military and the American people. Now, due to the so-called compromise, this year's NDAA greenlights the Biden administration's horrendous policies of treating our military like a social experiment. You know, for a long time, I have firmly believed that our nation's incredible military will never be defeated by an outside force before we rot from the inside first. And that's exactly what these woke policies are doing. It's the real reason recruiting is at rock bottom levels for our military. For example, the NDAA feel, fails to eliminate the Pentagon's chief diversity officer. It fails to ban mask mandates on military installations and fails to prevent the Department of Defense education activity from teaching radical gender and racial ideologies. Not to mention the NDAA allows Joe Biden's Department of Defense to waste taxpayer dollars on transgender surgeries, drag queen shows, and abortion travel. Abortion travel, imagine that. The radical left will stop at nothing to advance the evils of abortion, even if their vile efforts violate federal law. Additionally, a vote for this year's NDAA is a vote to reauthorize warrantless surveillance on the American people. That's right. To make matters worse, a clean reauthorization of FISA 702, which has been dangerously abused to spy on Americans, 
Literally, last year, 278,000 times it was illegally used to spy on Americans, and it was attached to this year's National Defense Authorization Act. So let me be perfectly clear. The Fourth Amendment is not a suggestion, and I certainly will not be fear-mongered by the intelligence community in order to allow this egregious, unconstitutional abuse to continue. So either get a warrant or let FISA go dark, which means let FISA's authorization expire on 1231. Furthermore, FISA's author reauthorization should have never been attached to the NDAA in the first place. An extension of FISA is not germane to the NDAA, meaning this legislation violates our January agreement of germane single-subject bills. But since leadership plans to pass the NDAA under suspension of the rules, members will have no opportunity to raise the appropriate point of order against this non-germane matter. My colleagues, this is not how Washington should operate. Members deserve the opportunity to debate legislation and vote on these matters separately. That is what we agreed to in January, and that is the standard we must now follow. For all these reasons, I am a hard no on the FY24 NDAA, and I urge all my colleagues to join me in taking a firm stand against this bad bill. As a 28-year Navy combat veteran, I'm disgusted by the Biden administration's ongoing efforts to weaken our great military with woke and weaponized policies, and I'm greatly disturbed by this body's blind acceptance of these nefarious efforts so they can go home early for Christmas. Our military, our nation, deserve better. Thank you, and I yield back to my gentleman from, gentleman from Texas. I yield four minutes to the gentleman from Virginia. Thank you to my friend, Mr. Cloud, from Texas for holding this very important discussion here on the House floor, because what we'll be voting on tomorrow represents the very worst of Washington. I was thankful that back in the summer, for the first time since I've been in Congress, I could vote for an NDAA, because after two years in the minority, where the majority party under this president believes that the greatest threat to the military is climate, that the greatest threat to the military are conservatives, patriots, God forbid Trump supporters in the military. And that's been the focus of this administration as it relates to our military. And so I voted four times against bad NDAAs that were focused on climate extremism, that were fo focused on forcing our military to convert to electric vehicles, that were focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and CRT training in our academies, red flag for our military members, forcing our daughters to be drafted, uh, f focused on f funding for abortion in the military, funding for transgender surgery. But this past summer, our Republican conference passed a good NDAA that I was proud to vote for because it reversed those harmful policies. And then we were supposed to have a conference committee that would go and negotiate with the Senate. We're actually the stronger body with our majority than the Senate is because the Senate has to have 60 votes to pass legislation. And last time I checked, there's only 51 Democrats over there. But in the House here, we can pass whatever we want with a one-vote majority. So we should be the stronger party in negotiations. But you know that conference committee really never took place. Instead, a new NDA was negotiated from what are called the four corners. The House, the House Speaker, the House Minority Leader, the Senate Majority Leader, and the Senate Minority Leader come up with a new NDAA that takes out all of the good things that we fought for, the policy wins, in the NDA we voted for last summer. To make it worse, we're going to combine that with an extension of FISA. Surveillance on U.S. citizens, trampling on our most precious constitutional freedoms in this country with no reforms. Our friend Andy Biggs authors the bill at a judiciary to reform FISA with help from individuals like Chip Roy, who's here with us tonight, and Warren Davidson. But instead of bringing that bill to the floor for a vote as an individual bill, instead we're going to take a FISA extension with no reforms, not fixing the constitutional issues, not protecting Americans from warrantless surveillance on them like they're foreign terrorists. And we're going to combine the two together in an effort to force passage on suspension of the rules, nonetheless, that some members of this body might be afraid to vote against a bad FISA bill because they don't want to be accused of being against the military. But the NDAA is a bad bill. Attaching to FISA, it makes it that much worse. Every Republican should vote against it. Thank you, Mr. Cloud, for holding this time of discussion tonight, and I yield back. How much time? Thank you, Mr. Good. Uh, may I ask how much time remains? The gentleman has four minutes. 
four minutes. I yield the remainder of the time to the gentleman from the great state of Texas, Mr. Roy. Well, I thank my friend from Texas. Uh, he's one of my best friends in the House and one of the uh, best members we have in this body. His constituents are blessed to have him. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm proud to stand here with these gentlemen here on the floor. Um, I will say in firm defense of our men and women in uniform and in firm defense of our appropriate use of intelligence, surveillance on foreign subjects, on foreign targets. That is what we should be doing. But instead, it has been abused by the FBI, abused by our intelligence apparatus to target Americans. So what are we going to do when we finally get the chance to deal with the reauthorization, but we're going to kick the can down the road, extend it to April, and that means extending it until April of 2025 so the same procedures, the same abuses can continue with nothing but the promises of reforms within the FBI. That's not good enough. This is the people's house. We are supposed to stand up and defend the people who sent us here. I want to read something. In a Christmas Day 1944 letter to his mother and sister Rose living in Washington, D.C., Sergeant David Warman, 1st Infantry Division, wrote, quote, This is Christmas morning, and I'm writing from a foxhole. The weather is very clear and sunny, and there's slightly over two inches of snow, which fell the other day. It is way below freezing, and I'm wrapped in blankets as I write. As you know from the papers, the Germans have come out of their holes to put on a great drive to push us off their soil. He later writes in that letter, let's hope the end is near and peace again comes to earth quickly and this time permanently. How are you both? I hope you have a happy holiday season and don't have too many gloomy thoughts about me. True, my life is very uncomfortable and I might say uncertain, but I'm still around and who knows, I may get out without a scratch, so don't worry about me. He and the men next to him in those foxholes knew why they were there. Those of us in this body need to pause and consider whether we know why we're here, whether we're doing our duty with the seriousness demanded by the sacrifices like theirs. When we get on our planes and fly home for Christmas, rather than doing our job to protect the civil liberties of the American people by reforming FISA and doing our job here, we are doing a disservice to those men who sat in the foxholes on Christmas Day in 1944. And to the men and women in uniform, we ask to go around the world defending us. And I get a little sick and tired of the preaching on the floor about what we need to do to defend our men and women in uniform by you must pass the NDAA and you must do it now. But never mind the reforms you need to do to ensure we are doing it the right way to make sure our military is focused on its mission rather than social engineering so that you can boost the morale, boost recruiting, boost the effectiveness, undo the damage being done, and not layer on it a disastrous kicking the can down the road by putting more surveillance powers still on the back of our men and women in uniform. That is not the way that we should be conducting business. I implore my colleagues on this side of the aisle, don't do that. Don't use our men and women in uniform as an excuse to shirk our responsibility to actually reform the laws we were sent here to reform. We have bipartisan legislation sitting right before us, Judiciary Committee, Intel Committee, that would reform these things. We should put them on the floor. We should put one of them on the floor. We should amend them, and then we should send it to the Senate and tell them to do their job. We should stop governing by fear and the false uh, pressure of deadlines. Let's do our job for the American people. Let's send them a Christmas present that we're going to stand up and defend them and their civil liberties. That's what we should do tomorrow. I implore my colleagues to oppose the NDAA with FISA added on it. I yield back. Does the gentleman Thank have you. a motion to adjourn? Do we, do we have time? Make a motion to adjourn. Oh. Yes. 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 I move to adjourn. The question is on the motion to adjourn. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. Aye. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted according to the House stands adjourned until 9 a.m. tomorrow.